Where I'm standing right now in 1945 would have been completely destroyed to rubble by U.S. airstrikes and naval bombardments. As you can see now, it's a bit different with a metropolis behind me and some beautiful water and luscious, vibrant colors. Where am I? Well, this is Okinawa, the bloodiest battle in the Pacific theater during World War II. And we're gonna go throughout this island and recite and review everything that has changed and what happened during that battle. So join me as we go through Okinawa. Check it out. I must say, in the last 10 months of backpacking, I've only been in basically cold weather except for Morocco and Egypt. But so far, Okinawa. I like it. Let's check it out. Now in US history books, we learn a lot about the Pacific Theater because the Americans were the only ones really fighting down in here. But when you learn about in US history books, the battles that took place here, you hear of Iwo Jima and the Battle of Midway and Okinawa. But when I tell you Okinawa was the most important battle won by the Americans in the Pacific Theater, it changed the course of the future of the war. And the reason it was so important is because Truman and the military cabinet was using Okinawa as a staging point for uh, American military operations when they invaded mainland Japan, which was going to be the future invasion happening once Okinawa was taken. And Okinawa being the bloodiest battle of the Pacific Theater, taking 89 days to take over the island, made the entire US cabinet rethink their operation and eventually go to the atomic weapon. And check this out, the old hair color cafe. Something that's been very interesting while going through Japan is seeing the different types of shops that are here. And that one obviously is a, uh, it's a hair salon with a cafe in it which isn't the most abstract concept because when I was in Tokyo, there was a barber shop that was a full-blown diner. You would eat and get your haircut or get your haircut and eat you chose. And it's just interesting because Japan has a lot of these concepts that get put together that maybe back home would look very strange, but here it just, it works. Now check this out, I haven't seen this before. At Domino's in Okinawa, they deliver your pizzas on a little scooter. Look at that, you just put the pizza right in the back there, you get on the scooter, maybe the front is for some drinks or cash or something. Wow. Japanese Okinawa Domino's. I can tell you that I don't crave that at all, but it's interesting to see. Anyways, let's head to where the Japanese military would have dug in here in Okinawa. So we've taken our first steps inside the Japanese naval headquarters here in Okinawa and right now it's decorated with a bunch of the pictures um, from American servicemen to Japanese servicemen here, caves, there's a lot of cave systems built here in Okinawa. This was the, the landing of the Americans on the beaches. Um, and what's super interesting as well, it shows all of the deadly and poisonous snakes here that inhabit Okinawa. Something that. I don't think ever gets really talked about during um, any of the, the invasions of the, the, the battles that happened in the Pacific is what the U.S. service member, when you're on these islands, you're exposed to the elements of the weather, the heat, the rain during the rainy season, and especially the poisonous animals. Now, the Battle of Okinawa was seen as the last stand for the Japanese. The Japanese military understood at this point that the war was basically over, but they wanted to slow down the U.S. advance and cause as many casualties as possible. That is why during the Battle of Okinawa there were groups of student regiments that came in that was fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and lances um, and a lot of them hid out in caves and, and tried to de de delay the U.S. advance for as long as possible. This led to almost the eradication of the entire Japanese military on the island which was about 80,000. Now this entire tunnel system here was dug out by hand, shovel, and pickaxe, and it goes 105 stairs down into the ground. Now, the reason that these tunnels were built and it was the last stand of the Japanese military was because everyone on this island, the 80,000 soldiers that fought here, and including the students, 
um, had this idea of there was no surrender happening and that they fought for this island and this is their home and they were gonna die here. And just to give you a size comparison of what these tunnels are, is I'm about 180 centimeters, five foot 10 for American standards. And I have to be bent down, crouched over to walk through these tunnels. And this was no basic tunnel system. Down here, full headquarters operations needed to happen. So they would hang wire up here so that they would have full uh, electricity for any lights and uh, communications through telegram, uh, so forth. Now you may not be able to make out what this wall is in front of you. However, each one of these little dots would have been shrapnel from a hand grenade uh, used by the Japanese high command as the Americans made their way farther south uh, towards the end of the island and eventually uh, the Japanese high command took their own life. There was one final telegraph sent by the vice admiral of the Japanese Navy to the high command in mainland Japan expressing how the people of Okinawa fought, how this battle of Okinawa was very important to the American war machine. However, the people here on Okinawa were the people that suffered the most. They were inscribed to military service um, against their will, basically, but they had to defend their homeland. And what that last telegram was sent back to was to give them recognition. The entire island of Okinawa was destroyed. All the plants, all the vegetation, there was nothing left. It was just a burnt crisp. And the vice admiral at the time of the Japanese Navy wanted the people of Okinawa to be recognized and never forgotten. Guys, check this out here. As we come through this part of the tunnel, I have to bend down very much so. I'm almost literally on my knees walking through here, but I want to show you this. This, the end of the tunnel here, is where the final stand of the Japanese military happened. So as the Americans are closing in, most of the Japanese military in here had no more ammunition for their weapons and had to use spears and swords. And this is where the final kamikaze attack happened. And out there were awaiting American service members uh, to where the, almost the final battles of Okinawa happened. Now in the end, due to the overwhelming amount of American firepower and American manpower, they were able to take the island of Okinawa. However, in the end, a combined 250,000 American, Japanese servicemen, and people of Okinawa were killed during the fighting. Now this taught a lot to the U.S. High Command about what their plans were for the mainland invasion of Japan, and basically it taught them that there's no way that they can make a full-scale invasion of Japan without an estimated 1 to 2 million U.S. casualties just basing on what happened here in Okinawa. But it's always crazy to me coming to these places that we grow up learning about in the history textbooks and to see them with your own eyes, you know. There were 60 miles of underground tunnels used by the Japanese military here, which made the U.S. advance so difficult. And on top of that, both the Japanese and the American military had first-time commanders commanding this battle, which is why it was so chaotic. Chaotic. Well, that's going to do it for today's adventure through the underground workings of the Japanese military. But tomorrow, we're going to head to somewhere where you may be more familiar with it. And it goes by the U.S. service member of Desmond Doss and his story. You might know it as Hacksaw Ridge.